Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to be here. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Dublin to celebrate this very special occasion. And uh, uh, of course, it's not easy to speak immediately after Edmund because uh, we were just uh, dreaming about the aesthetics and the importance of arts and creativity. And for me to talk in a more pragmatic way, it's uh, a big challenge. But I am extremely pleased to have this occasion to share with you uh, uh, about the work we have been developing in the United Nations on this topic. And uh, indeed, uh, our aim is uh, really try to pass exactly what Edmund made to us, to pass the emotion and uh, to sensitize policymakers, to sensitize the governments, to help to sensitize the public opinion about the importance of creativity, the importance of uh, talent people who has devoted their lives to do art. And uh, this is the context in which I would like to share with you uh, what we have been doing in recent years. So, as has been said, this is our second report. Uh, of course, this is a, it's a lot of things here that uh, I try to make a brief overview. But for those who will be interested in this report, this report is accessible through our web page. And for those who would be really interested in having time to read it, I'll be very glad to send it to you, if you wish. But um, as was mentioned, uh, this indeed uh, is the second report because we launched the first report in 2008. And uh, the idea was just because we have been discussing about the creative industries and the creative economy, but we thought that was important to, to, to really, uh, people has different understanding of what this really means. And we thought that it was important to propose not um, um, concepts that people has to agree, but to try to pass a shared vision and based in particular on evidence and comparative analysis to see how the sector and how the creative economy can really contribute to socioeconomic growth in uh, all parts of the world. So this report, uh, uh, it's, it builds upon on the previous version, but it really went a little bit deeper in the research. Uh, we undercore uh, 10 key messages to facilitate governments and policy making. And uh, one of the key messages is that indeed, the creative industries is one of the most dynamic sector in the world economy uh, in recent years. And uh, the subtitle of the report is because we really believe that is a feasible option to foster a more inclusive and sustainable development. So the background is that particular uh, as you might be aware, the, the terminology of a creative economy was, uh, it's a relatively new concept, and uh, it came up with the book published by John Hawkins in 2001. And uh, of course, the UK policy, it has been very inspiring for all this movement uh, around the creative industries. So in this context, uh, this whole decade from 2000 to 2010, the topic of the creative economy really became, as we say, well inserted in what we call the economic and development agenda. So the idea is really to, to assist uh, mainly governments uh, to, to have a, a better grasp between the conceptual, the institutional, and the policy framework in which this uh, discussion has been developing. So what uh, we could notice is that there is a growing number of countries 
And uh, I should say that not only in developing countries, but also in the most advanced countries uh, in Europe, like here, that is really looking to the sector from much more um, a strategic view, and in particular to see <clears throat> the impact of the sector for the whole economy. So this was really behind the key motivations that led us to issue uh, this second issue of the report uh, just two years after the first edition. And uh, what was important is that uh, we decided to, to prepare this new report was also because the world has changed. So if you consider what was going on in the period from 2000 to 2005, in which the world economy was growing uh, uh, everywhere, and then suddenly something happened that changed the course of the global economy, and as you know, was the financial crisis. And uh, I think it's very important to see this work in the current context of uh, uh, the economic context today. And uh, there was a number of things we learned from the financial crisis. And one of the key points is that we need a more, uh, I would say, a better balance between uh, policy interventions, between public policies and the market, because we, we could see that the market alone cannot address imbalances. Uh, it was also important to see that globalization is a reality, uh, but uh, it, I think it's important to take a step back from the global and start to look more closely to what is going on at the local level and try to identify specificities, identities, and not only economic difference, but also the cultural. And uh, we all know that the financial crisis caused uh, one of the sharpest drop of economic growth in six years. Uh, the global recession uh, undermined the jobs, growth, but also social well-being in everywhere in the world. And we could see that there were shortcomings in terms of the new liberal model. And uh, when we discuss the creative economy and when we think in the creative economy, we think that uh, we are in the moment of somehow a paradigm shift in which uh, we are looking for uh, what we call a more holistic approach to development in which we should try to better understand the interface between uh, economics, culture, technology, and the social aspects. And I think this is what the creative economy is about it. We could also see uh, with this report and with the uh, economic analysis we carried out that some of the knowledge-based creative sectors were more resilient to in terms of the external shocks and uh, as we all know, economic recovery remains fragile. There is still a lot of instability, instability in terms of monetary policies, uh, unemployment is still quite high. There is a rise of a public deficits in many countries. Uh, so it's in this context that we have to think in terms of how we could see the creative economy and try to find the more creative responses to stimulate uh, socioeconomic growth. So the report itself has 10 big chapters that I'll try briefly to go for some of those chapters. But uh, what is also important is that uh, we set up a database. So it also has a statistical annex. And we also have this database that is also accessible through our web page in which countries can draw their own country profiles in terms of uh, uh, creative goods and services, particularly in terms of trade. And I'll tell a little bit later uh, why we choose trade. And uh, the report also tried to bring some uh, more 
uh, pragmatism to the analysis, so we have a number of cases illustrating how the work of uh, artists and creators has been important in terms of uh, uh, bringing a new dynamism for the economy. So uh, the first chapter deals with the concepts and the context in which the whole discussion about the creative economy has been evolved. And um, this is a long issue that I'm not going to detail, but just to tell you uh, that we discuss the concept and the notions and the definition of creativity, the cultural industries, cultural economics, and what we call nowadays also the experience economy that we uh, would like to, uh, the importance of uh, emotions, uh, in the way we live, uh, and also the concept of the creative economy in the way they are applied to cities, like uh, the creative cities that many cities all over, in many parts of the world are using the concept to revitalize growth, particular cities that were based on the industrial era. Uh, also the concept of the creative class, uh, the concept of the clusters, so how all those concepts has evolving, and uh, in particular the importance of what we have been seeing more and more, what is called the collaborative creation. Uh, there are also the key drivers of the creative economy is first because there is a very strong link with the technology and what we call the soft innovations. So this means that uh, our products that are not based on the traditional idea of the technology of process, but can also be innovations in terms of uh, shapes, in terms of uh, new products. And uh, this is what we see in the creative economy. Uh, the importance in terms of the aspects that can define the global demand. And here, demographics play a very strong role because we can see from one side we have the younger generation that has more access to creations, uh, be it through mobile telephones, uh, being by uh, texts. But on the other hand, we can see also that the generation of people that has a very long life expectancy, so they have more free time for leisure, for culture, so we have the two sides are really having a very positive impact in the demand for most creative products. The main definition we consider it's important in the concept of the creative economy is that we see is the linkage between the creative industries being at the heart of the creative economy. But of course, we consider the creative industries as the cycle that goes from the creation, the production, and the distribution of goods and services that uses creativity and intellectual capital as their main inputs. Uh, so they can be tangible goods like uh, the pots you mentioned, or they can be intangible like uh, the dream that we have about the ideas you put forward in your book for instance, but what all those projects they have in common is that they have a creative content, they have a cultural and economic value, and they also have a marked objective. So this is the framework in which we see this sector, and they are able to generate, potentially they can generate revenues through trade and through intellectual property. And what is interesting in those sectors is that they really cut across from the artisan side to products and from manufacturing. This is what we call the UNCTAD definition of the creative industries. And why I say is the UNCTAD definition is just because this is not the only one. It's one among a number of definitions 
But this is the definition that we define in the United Nations because our main concern is really the development I mentioned. And uh, we divide the creative industries in four main groups uh, in which we started with the, all the sectors linked to heritage, uh, linked to traditional knowledge, linked to traditional cultural expressions, is, is precisely in this sector that uh, the craft industries is placed, as not only the craft industries, but also folklore, as also festivals, uh, festivities that we have in different countries. So this is a very important sector that we consider is the basis in which all the other sectors has been evolved. So from one side, we have the traditional cultural expressions. On the other side, we have the cultural sites, the museums, the exhibitions, the galleries. Then we have the group of arts, performing arts and visual arts, the groups of media, uh, in which one side we have the publishing and the books, literature, but also newspapers, uh, 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 the audiovisual sector, uh, including uh, radio, TV, broadcast in general. And then uh, the group that we classified as the functional creations. And here we will include all aspects of design, growing from uh, graphic design, interior design, fashion, uh, also the creative services, which includes architecture, advertising, digital services, cultural services, and so on. And uh, the group of new media that we consider it's a part, because here we are talking mainly in terms of uh, products that have digitalized creative content. And uh, this classification became quite important because it was based on this classification that we set up our database. So the creative industries is indeed uh, in the developed world. There was studies uh, made in the context of uh, the European Commission uh, in which the creative sector seems to be growing much faster than the conventional services indeed four times as compared to the traditional manufacturing. Uh, and the creative industries is really giving a very strong contribution to output, to value added, to jobs, innovation. And uh, there was a study in the area of OECD countries that shows the variations that goes from about uh, uh, 2.5 to up to 6-7% of a GDP in certain countries. Uh, the topic became also very important in the so-called European 2020 agenda, particular because of its impact for job creation, particular for the youth, because the youth are very interested in those sectors. They are very attracted by media, by innovation, by music, by film. So it's a very important sector, and particularly when you make this close linkage with the innovation. In the US, the creative industries has been growing at uh, the rate of 6.4%, uh, and is one of the main uh, sectors in terms of uh, export earnings. Uh, the same for the UK economy. And uh, also here in Ireland, uh, I have been researching, and um, there is uh, the uh, creative sectors provide 7% of jobs. Uh, and of course, there was uh, difficult moments that was brought with the, with the crisis in 2008, but uh, Dublin acts really as a hub for creative industries uh, that has about 12% of jobs and contribution of 3.25 billion uh, for gross value added. 
Um, in terms of the development I mentioned, as I mentioned, is a sector that is very important for a number of developing countries, uh, in particular because it has a very strong impact in terms of a gender balance, uh, because there is a lot of women working in this area. Uh, it's also important because it's a sector that we can uh, bring partnerships. Uh, um, and uh, what uh, one of the aspects we would like to uh, point out in this chapter, it's really the linkage between traditional knowledge, culture, and the creative economy, in which uh, the crafts, the songs, the music, the stories, that uh, these are really cultural values that should be kept alive, alive and should be preserved preserved and should be promoted. So this is one of the key aspects of uh, our analysis on this chapter. We also introduced a new reflection in this report that is really the linkage between the creative economy and what we call today the green economy, in the sense that most creative industries are environmentally friendly and uh, there is now more and more uh, uh, artists are really uh, reflecting in the choice of materials that they use. And, uh, and the creative economy is really producing products that are non-polluting, that you can really choose a, a process that are less energy, that are more energy saving, and uh, so it's really calling for this more, uh, how we mentioned, a more ethical behavior from both the parts of creators, but also I think it's very important for the part of all of us as consumers. So, and here, key examples are the whole discussion about eco-fashion, eco-tourism, and particularly in the area of design the choose of materials. Um, I'm going a little bit faster on this chapter, but uh, here uh, we look into, for instance, the power of social networks uh, nowadays that is connecting uh, people, uh, but is also that is being used and it has been very important, particularly for developing countries, to access global markets, and also for creators and for artisans, that uh, there is a lot of artists that work uh, independently, and uh, it's very important to use all these ICT tools uh, to facilitate uh, the uh, outreach of their products. So this is an aspect that uh, we analyzed in the chapter of the report. And also the fact that uh, we see nowadays it's no longer a very, uh, how I say, that we have specific roles. Because nowadays we have uh, more and more consumers uh, go into the online and participate in CITES and what we call the prosumers, in which uh, some uh, consumers build upon some creations to really create another product. So we are really in a different moment in which uh, the whole traditional way of uh, distribution and competition among the different creative products, it's being, has to be reviewed in light of these recent developments. Um, one of the key aspects of this report is that we try to bring some evidence uh, to governments because it's very difficult to sensitize the government to the importance of the sector if we don't have uh, figures. So, uh, and it was very difficult even when we discuss about the impact of the sector in GDP because it depends on how each country classify the creative industries. So this is the reason why we look into the trade figures because we look into uh, official data provided by all 
member countries to the United Nations, and we used the same basket. So, uh, and that was very interesting because, uh, of course, we live in a contemporary society in that is indeed more and more dominated by images, by sounds, by texts, by symbols, and that we live in a new lifestyle in which culture, leisure, and entertainment are taking a very important part of uh, our lives. And what was interesting to see is that uh, for the year 2008, uh, that was the year that we really look into this analysis, we could see that despite the economic crisis, the world market for certain creative goods and services continued to grow. And this was very interesting because there was even a, a survey made uh, in the US in the first quarter of 2009, and that was really the, the peak of the crisis, in which people were going much more to the cinemas because uh, they, they want to escape. Uh, and, and this was, was, was quite interesting because this study has shown that, uh, and uh, there was also a survey made uh, in France that people were going more to museums to see artwork. So it was very interesting to see that this sector has a completely different dynamic of the more traditional sectors of the world economy. And, uh, and this for us was really a big surprise when we saw the results of our research because uh, despite of a 12% drop in international trade, the exports of creative goods and services continue to grow and reach 592 billion in 2008. And uh, I should say that this figure is underestimated because of course there is a number of sectors that we don't have figures, we cannot capture also in terms of methodology, but it's very important in terms of uh, identifying trends. And, uh, and what was interesting was to see that this positive development is taking place in different parts of the world. And uh, we do believe that this trend is likely to continue. Of course, there are certain products that are more affected than others. For instance, craft is a sector that was more penalized because we have less tourism. But there was other sectors like uh, uh, the products that are more consumed at home, like videos, like books, like uh, films, like music, that uh, was really not so hardly affected by the crisis. But what was important is that the exports of goods and services continue to have a very strong growth. So in this chart, you can see that uh, uh, in all sectors, uh, we can see that both developing and developed countries are benefiting from this market, is that uh, basically all products that has high value added are mainly exported by advanced countries, which is a logical way. And uh, for instance, in 2008, the share in total exports of audiovisuals, we have 90% uh, for uh, audiovisuals and music, uh, then about 8% uh, for publishing and uh, media, and about 75% of uh, visual arts uh, are markets that are, uh, have a leadership of uh, the most advanced countries. While developing countries respond to the exports of 65% of crafts, and they are gaining market share also in terms of products like new media and design. Um, here we can see the evolution of the different sectors, including the arts and crafts, in which uh, in 2008, in 2002, where the exports accounted for 17.5 billion, 
and there was this very strong growth to 32 billion in 2008. So this is a very significant uh, evolution. Uh, the world market for art crafts is the global market. Uh, this is a key message that uh, we have been trying uh, to sensitize governments because for many years this was a sector that somehow has been neglected and neglected in terms of lack of public policies to support the sector. And the message we want to give is that this is a sector that has to be seen as a, that gives a very strong contribution for economic development. Uh, and also because there is this very strong linkage with the tourism industry that, uh, 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 and also the fact that I think nowadays we are much more engaged and committed to look into uh, uh, cultural diversity and to promote the cultural and diversity in different parts of the world. So we are looking for products that are genuine, that has a special touch, that brings a different meaning. And I think this is very positive for the market of arts and crafts. And this is why I see as a sector that has a very strong potential for further growth. So the, the international trade in crafts indeed had annual growth of 9% in the six years uh, from 2002 to 2008. And um, despite the economic downturn, in 2008 exports from uh, developed countries at a total 11.4 billion. And here we have in particular Belgium and the US as uh, one of the leading uh, markets in the context of the developed countries. And in developing countries, we have China that is a very uh, big exporter of uh, crops as well. And uh, in terms of uh, areas, uh, we could see that uh, products based on yards, carpets, uh, white work, paperware, uh, are some of the products that has very strong penetration in world markets. Yes. Um, so this is the situation in terms of the exports of uh, arts and crafts uh, from different countries. This is the particular situation in terms of uh, Europe uh, that uh, we can see uh, the market share of uh, individual countries. This is what we found in terms of the main destinations of uh, exports from crafts from Ireland, in which the UK is a key market, followed by US. And I think uh, here it's also an important impact in terms of uh, Ireland has a very strong diaspora and I think this really it's, uh, gives a great contribution in terms of demand for Irish products. Uh, of course, it's very important in reflection about the importance of intellectual property rights and uh, in particular, the fact that traditional knowledge and uh, it's very important, the protection of uh, uh, products that uh, and the difference between the rights and public domain, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to focus too much on this. Also, the whole discussion about the importance of technology and connectivity uh, in the whole context of the creative economy. But uh, uh, what is important, we have a chapter devoted to policy strategies and the role that we see for, for governments. Uh, in terms of uh, the role of public policies. So we really see governments as a facilitator of this project, but uh, the need for what we call concerted uh, uh, cross-cutting mechanisms involving different departments, uh, the need for strategic actions, the importance of uh, uh, 
infrastructure, the importance of uh, institutional frameworks like as the one of the Arts Council, it's very important. Uh, the fact that we need the special mechanisms for financing and investing uh, because there are new business models for, for the creative products. Uh, the importance to promote public-private partnerships, to encourage learning, to work jointly with the academia, with universities. So we see that it's very important that uh, uh, to have uh, an enabling environment that will be conducive for enhancing uh, creative capacities as the, this is really a key component. And for this, uh, we think it's important to attract investors, to have uh, technologies in place, to have a strategy for entrepreneurship, to, be, to have a capacity building on cultural entrepreneurship because most of the artists, they are very good on their artistics, but they need support to be able to sell their products and we want to see more and more artists that are able to be seen as professional, as full-time professionals. We don't want to see uh, artisans that unfortunately have to, many of them have to be taxi drivers and to do their works only the weekends. So this is why it's important to have uh, entrepreneurship, to have uh, uh, trade policies behind to support this work, to have uh, export promotion strategies and so on. Uh, it's also important to define national policies, take into account the global process that have an impact in markets. And this is where we see the role of institutions like the UN, that we brought this issue to the, what we call the economic agenda, to sensitize the governments to look into the sector. Also, the importance of the work of the different parts of the uh, UN agents, for instance, the Convention on Cultural Diversity that has been very important, the discussions in terms of WTO, of market access, the door around, the discussions in terms of the development agenda for intellectual property issues. So the point we want to make here is that we have to keep in mind all this global process when we define policies for the creative economy. And to conclude, the report brings some uh, 10 key messages. And one of the key messages is that uh, the creative economy can really be a sector that can help governments to diversify their economies and to leapfrog into high value added products. That uh, in particular in the developing countries, we saw that there is a very big trend between what we call now South-South trade uh, the importance of to put in place what we call the creative nexus to bring together investors, technology, entrepreneurship. The importance of a concerted policies in which uh, it's when we talk about the creative industries, we want to make the point that we are not addressing our message only for, for instance, the Minister of Culture but we would like to be sitting together, defining together policy for creative economy, bringing ministers of science and technology, ministers of finance to see fiscal policies, ministers of labor to see the impact in job creation. So this is what we call the need for interministerial responses. The importance of IPR issues, it's very important that the artists could better understand particularly the changes that are taking place in the legislation of intellectual property. The importance of ICT tools to enhance the creative capacities. The fact that policies should be much more specific than generic and uh, that actions has to be taken at different levels from the municipality point of view involving communities, municipal level, and then at national level. That is important to have a, a process that is open, that will allow for partnerships and for ownership, that uh, to keep in mind that we, these sectors are very present in our daily life, we wake up in the morning, we listen to the radio, we look at the news, we see TV. So 
this is really part of our life, so let us see how we can support all this. And finally, to say that uh, all this work, we are not prescribing uh, one size fits all prescription, but we really think that every country should look into the sector for their own perspective, see the areas where they have these trends, uh, their own realities, their cultural background, and then define the best policies. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there is also a video clip that in case we'll have time, we'll show you that will give you a better overview of uh, how we have been developing this work in the United Nations. Thank you very much for your attention.